This presentation is on the current state of the world's newest country, South Sudan. Uh, South Sudan gained uh, its independence from the north on the 9th of July 2011, uh, after 98% of the country voted pro-independence in January 2011. Unfortunately, the celebration soon turned to civil unrest and the nation fell into civil war. The tribes within the South Sudan have only been under one government since the Turkish occupation of the Sudan in the 19th century which means before that they were all operating individually and now have the added vulnerability of power struggle over the entire nation among tribes, which is where President Kier and Dr. Machar come in. This is Salva Kier Mayardit. He was the vice president to the Sudan before the 2011 split and is now the president of South Sudan. He's a Dinka and the head of the predominantly Dinka SPLM, the Sudanese People's Liberation Movement. He's uh, also currently under allegation for having ordered his government troops to kill local Noor peoples in Juba in 2010 following an attempted government coup. And this is Dr. Riyak Machar, who leads the Noor rebels, or the White Army, in opposition against Kir's Sudanese People's Liberation Army. He was the first vice president of South Sudan until in late 2013 armed men opened fire on the country's leaders and President Kir blamed Dr. Machar for the attempted government takeover. Machar fled the capital city of Juba and denied the allegations. Although Dr. Machar and President Kier are both native Sudanese, they come from separate tribes within the political borders that form South Sudan, Kier being Dinka and Machar being Noor. Both were part of the Sudanese People's Liberation Movement, in fact both were leaders, until the alleged coup in 2013, and both are now leaders of their own armies in opposition of one another. So, the 2013 attempt at President Kier's seat of power initially started the ethnic violence, and Machar was imprisoned for it with three other high-ranking politicians pictured here with Machar until they were released in March 2014, but were encouraged to stay in the country to, quote, promote peace. Meanwhile, Kira's SPLA maintained its campaign against those who threatened the seat of Dinka power in the government. Even though tens of thousands have been killed and about 1.5 million South Sudanese people have been displaced, there still is no way of knowing who was actually responsible for the coup. The two Sudanese leaders continuously deny the other's accusations, so for now, peace talks are unproductive, and the constant fighting between the two groups is only making his stable ceasefire more and more unlikely. The first of such attacks came directly after the coup, which raised suspicions in some that President Kier had framed Dr. Machar to get rid of him so that he could embark on a campaign of ethnic violence without the presence of Noor cabinet members. Kier immediately sent a special battalion of all Dinka SPLA troops who killed hundreds of Noor people in Juba in the days following the coup. The Sudanese People's Liberation Army is the official army of South Sudan, but before that, they had waged a two-decade-long insurgency against Khartoum, the government of the north. The SPLA operates on about $150 million American dollars a year, and amid the current conflict, is having trouble finding supplies and troops, so much so that the SPLA is drafting child soldiers into its ranks. The White Army is the predominantly Noor tribal militia led by Dr. Machar, fighting against the SPLA. They are estimated at about 30,000 strong, and also enlist the help of child soldiers. The White Army holds most of its territory in rural areas and they have taken oil fields in the north from President Kier in lieu of heavy deployment of SPLA troops to that area. The White Army and the SPLA continue to fight for control of oil fields along the northern border of the country as well as for cities within the country. In March 2014, rebel forces attempted to push into other key cities outside of Malaki Town. The rebels' assault was pushed out of McCall and back to Malaki Town where they eventually deserted. Since the start of violence at the end of 2013, child soldiers have started to appear within the ranks of both forces. People fleeing the fighting in Rukona reported seeing dozens of teenage children in military uniforms firing on their opposition. The use of child soldiers has helped back sanctions put on South Sudan by the Western world, but doing so only further isolates South Sudan from order. Since the civil war has weakened the South Sudan government in Juba, other African nations have stepped in to assist the SPLA against the White Army most likely because of the amount of oil that the nation sits on. While Uganda is the primary contributor, Ethiopia also has troops on the ground. This is of concern to Khartoum because the South's instability has so far allowed them to have the upper hand on oil fields in disputed areas of the border with the North. While the death toll of the war continues to rise, the threat of the worst famine in decades also lingers in the South Sudan. The constant fighting has prevented farmers from being able to tend to the land. The problem is so bad that last July, the UN Security Council declared South Sudan's food crisis the worst in the world. On October 1, 2014, the UN threatened to put sanctions on both leaders if a peace agreement was not met. Peace talks have been going on since the start of 2014. 
The two leaders cannot agree mostly because of terms set by the opposition that prevent one of the two leaders from being president in the future. Each side has a 10-person delegation and the SPLM delegation includes three women who are members of the national parliament. South Sudan is 65% female and much of the violence is directed at the female population. Since the start of the conflict, a million and a half people have been internally displaced. Most of the people live in conflict zones and those who don't are still experiencing populations of displaced peoples as well as food shortages. Education and healthcare has taken a back seat to the war and the violence of the conflict and desperation of the people make it both difficult and dangerous for foreign aid agencies to gain access to the nation, although foreign aid isn't non-existent. Abye is an area technically owned by the South, but has been under northern control since May 2011, when the North pushed 5,000 troops into the area along with tanks and artillery fire and drove out nearly 20,000 inhabitants. The attack was precipitated by an ambush by the South that killed nearly two dozen North Sudanese soldiers. The area will continue to be fought over again because of its oil-rich preserves. Salva Kiir is certainly not an innocent player in Sudan's history. It is very clear that President Kiir has less concern for his own people than he does for his seat as the president. His ideology seems to be based around having power and using his identity as a dinka to motivate an army that is half responsible for destroying the country that President Kiir is supposed to be helping. Dr. Machar isn't very different. Although we don't know who initiated the civil war with an attempted coup, we do know that Dr. Machar has helped perpetuate the violence and has been a big reason for the failed peace talks because of his unwillingness to negotiate. Machar, like Kier, also seems to be motivated by power, destroying lives in his fight for Kier's job. The conflict in the South Sudan cannot end without an agreement between the two leaders. That being said, the longer the conflict goes on, the deeper the resentment is among the two tribes, which can cause prolonged ethnic tensions. The conflict is also bringing with it famine that threatens to kill tens of thousands if not attended to. The South Sudan is a vibrant country with rich culture and tons of natural resources, but as long as the conflict remains, so will a lack of human rights.